Welcome, everyone. I am Ingrid Wirth, an Associate Dean here at Vanderbilt Law School. On behalf of the Dean's Office, it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 Martin Luther King Day Lecture and to introduce our esteemed speaker. At the outset, um, I'd like to note my very deep thanks to the many people who made this event possible, including Bernadette Paschal Grafried, Kira Cruz Street, Victoria Dorward, and Jake. Welcome to the 2021 lecture. In this year, at this time, when our nation's capital was stormed by a mob that branded a Confederate flag. During this year in which the killing by police of unarmed black people continued pace and in which COVID had a disproportionate impact on communities of color, we realize how far, how terribly far we are from realizing the dreams and potential unleashed by Dr. King half a century ago. And we are reminded that law and legal institutions are both deeply flawed and path forward. Our guest today is exceptionally well qualified to address us at this important, perhaps pivotal moment. The Honorable Judge Carlton Reeves serves on the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Mississippi. He was nominated to that position by President Barack Obama in 2010. He is the second African American to serve on federal judiciary in Mississippi. The Honorable Judge Reeves was born in Fort Hood, Texas, earned a BA from Jackson State University and a JD from the University of Virginia School of Law. He served in private practice in Jackson, Mississippi, and he's also served the state and our nation in all branches of government as a law clerk to the Honorable Reuben Anderson, Mississippi Supreme Court, as a staff attorney on the Mississippi Supreme Court, and as an assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Mississippi, and of course, as a federal judge. Judge Reeves, let me thank you on behalf of the Dean's Office, the faculty, the students, and our entire community for taking the time to address us today. We look forward to an event when we can personally welcome you to our campus. Um, but thank you for being here today virtually. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Professor Worth. Uh, thank you for that introduction. I'm removing my mask now uh, in this age of COVID. Uh, sorry we could not be there personally uh, with one another. Uh, and um, now that my precious daughter lives there in Nashville, that has become my favorite city outside of Mississippi. But my roots with Vanderbilt actually go back more than 30 years ago. For it was in 1984, that I was uh, up for the Harry S. Truman Scholarship. And uh, my semifinal round, I had the opportunity to come to Vanderbilt uh, to go for my interviews there. And I'd never been to Nashville, never been to Vanderbilt. But when I got on the campus, it was such a stunningly beautiful place uh, that I came back to Jackson and one of the things that stood out in my mind that I remembered is that the room that we were in, this is somebody who, from Yazoo City now, who had gone to Jackson State. The room that we were in uh, at that, uh, in one of the uh, buildings in, in uh, Vanderbilt had chandeliers in it. And I came back to Jackson State and I said, wow, they got chandeliers in that building. So, so my time at Vanderbilt goes back to there. When I got the call from Miss Bernadette Pachel Griffey to do this, uh, I was indeed honored. I was uh, shocked. She called me several months ago. And since that time, I've struggled with 
what would be the right words to say. She called several months ago. So as months went by and as I thought about it and as I kept thinking about it, my thoughts changed. And so Ms. Gaffrey asked me just recently what was my theme and I still didn't know. Uh, and so I thank her for being very kind and patient with me for accommodating my delays and my procrastination with trying to figure out what a theme is or what the, the theme will be. Of course, any speaker task with honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is bound to struggle with his speech. What hasn't been said about King's life which one of his brilliant speeches and sermons hasn't been analyzed and dissected? What part of his vision hasn't been studied? But it wasn't these questions that have kept me from knowing what to say. No, what has driven my delay is what has caused all of us to struggle to focus these last few weeks. It's trauma. Trauma not to my body, but trauma to the body politic. Trauma caused by those horrifying images from what happened in Washington, D.C. just 20 days ago. The attempted yet deadly insurrection by our neighbors, our co-workers, and our fellow countrymen trying to overturn our democracy. Something that had not happened at the Capitol since February 1861. For each of us, there is some image in particular that, de that defines that darkest of days. Perhaps it is a TV still of law enforcement officers being beaten and trampled as rioters enter the Capitol. Or it is the heroic efforts of Officer Eugene Goodman single-handedly staring down a mob to protect our Senate? Or is it the photo of Officer Brian Sicknick, whose life was taken? Perhaps it is the vision of the flag of the Confederacy, that other insurrection flying freely in the halls of our government. Perhaps it is the American flag being ripped from its pole and being replaced with another. Or maybe it is a glimpse of an armed man jumping over seats in the Senate, searching for officials to capture or even kill. Or is it that noose erected on the grounds of the Capitol? Perhaps it is our members of Congress, fearful of their lives, taking cover. It might even be the troubling image of the black workers cleaning up after the white mob had trashed the place. All of these images are seared into our minds and it is inevitable that we will find new images of horror as the investigation continues and additional videos uh, will be unearthed. We will be shocked, we will be horrified. But there is one image that is as troubling as it is overlooked. It is a picture captured after the Capitol had been secured, after the insurrectionists had been allowed to leave through the broken doors of our democracy. It is a photograph of a man cleaning a statue in the Capitol Rotunda, wiping it free of tear gas and pepper spray. It is a statue of King. This statue was installed 25 years ago in the Capitol Rotunda. Addressing the crowd packed under the Great Dome that day, Coretta Scott King said she hoped the statue would always remind us that America's greatest strength is in its pluralism and in its respect for all the people. Change for justice and compassion will always ennoble all of us, she told the audience. It may seem a small thing installing a statue. King fought with the weapon of nonviolence, fought to build a new, just economy. 
a just government and a just society, things far greater than a three foot slab of stone, but installing that bust of King still representing something massive, something sacred. It was the first piece of, an, piece of art honoring a black person ever placed in the Capitol complex. Long before Congress formally acknowledged the role of enslaved people uh, in building the Capitol, King's statue represented the voices of those people saying, this is our country too. This is our democracy. This is our house. This is a house for we, the people. Compare King's statue to the others in the Capitol complex. Each state has to play, each state gets to place two monuments in the National Statuary Hall collection. My Mississippi chose two men. The first was James Zachariah George. He signed the order that directed Mississippi to secede from the Union. He served as a colonel in the Confederate Army. His public life was focused on limiting the hopes of a majority of Mississippi citizens. He made sure that they were deprived of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this Confederate successfully campaigned for the post-war Mississippi Constitution to legally disenfranchise Black people. My great-grandmother lived under that Constitution. My grandmother lived under that Constitution. My mother lived under that Constitution. And on this day, I live under a form of that same Constitution. The second man was Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy. His deeds need no introduction. Suffice it to say, he was the antithesis of those men in Philadelphia who dared to believe that they could stitch together a more perfect union. 100, 160 years ago, this very week, Davis resigned from the Senate and dedicated his soul to the cause of ripping apart that more perfect union. There are many more Confederates enshrined in Statuary Hall, like Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, Zebulon Vance, Joseph Wheeler, Uriah Rose, Edmund Smith, Wade Hampton, and Edward Douglas White. In addition to these Confederates who degrade our house, there are white supremacists like John Calhoun, Henry Clay, Andrew Jackson, and James Paul Clark, a man from my hometown of Yazoo City, Mississippi, who became one of Arkansas's racist governors. What does it mean for a statue of King to be so outnumbered by his oppressors. This month's insurrection gives us an answer. For when what rioters stormed the Capitol, they not only allowed King's statue to be desecrated, they honored statues of white supremacists like John Calhoun by posing for photographs with them. When the mostly white mob tore through the rotunda, they shouted, one phrase over and over, whose house, our house. Here's what it means when a black man's statue is so outnumbered by those glorifying white supremacy and insurrection. It means that those chants of whose house, our house are in an important and very horrifying sense, true. If King himself heard those chants, what would he have said? What actions would he be urging us to take? 
What justice would he be demanding? And let's talk about that for a minute. First, I know one thing, I know what King would not have been. That is, he would not have been surprised. If King heard us calling what happened at the Capitol a storming, he would have said, we were using a new name for an old phenomenon, a phenomenon as old as the Republic itself, a phenomenon King called white backlash. If King saw what has happened these last few years, like the election and the elevation of black officials, including to the presidency and now the vice presidency, if he saw that grassroots movement to affirm the truth that black lives matter. And if he saw those unified protesters of all ages, of all races, genders, religious and socioeconomic statuses demanding an end to racism and policing, King would have known the backlash was coming for he knew the backlashes in our own history. King knew the backlash to reconstruction, what he called that brief period of eminence and political power for black people defined by moments of unity between white and black citizens. The backlash was the Ku Klux Klan and the white league seeking to preserve white supremacy by lynching and terrorizing African-Americans. 1866, saw a three-day riot in Memphis where 46 Black folk were killed. And that same year in New Orleans where more than 30 African-Americans were murdered. In 1874, African-Americans were massacred in Vicksburg, Mississippi. The next year, the mayor of Clinton, Mississippi gathered a white paramilitary unit which hunted and killed dozens more. And in 1898, a mob of white supremacists armed with rifles and pistols marched on City Hall in Wilmington, North Carolina and overthrew the elected local government, forcing black and white officials to resign and running many of them out of town. The death and destructions were not confined to Southern states. Thanks to this backlash, of insurrection and terror, King said, the Southern aristocracy took the world and gave the poor white man Jim Crow, creating the secretaries, the segregated society that my Mississippi knew for over a century. King also knew that the backlash to his own moment, to his thunderous voice preaching nonviolence and pacifism and courageously confronting evil with the power of love, there was indeed backlash. Most famous were the assassination of a president, his brother, the Senator, Mega Evans, Malcolm X, Vernon Damer, and those innocent angels, Emmett, Addie Mae, Denise, Carol, and Cynthia. And obviously King himself. But there were also mobs just like the one we saw storming the Capitol. Think of the men, the women, the children who gathered to spit on the Little Rock Nine. Think of the shouting and the screams coming from the contorted faces of those who confronted the six-year-old girl, Ruby Bridges. Think about the students from Fisk, Tennessee State and Baptist Theological Seminary under the tutelage of James Lawson, who was expelled from your divinity school as they were descended upon at the Woolworths and attacked by white folk. 
Think of the masses that killed two and injured hundreds in the midst of James Meredith's attempt, attempt to integrate the University of Mississippi in 1962. Think of the police who used billy clubs, whips, horses, dogs, and tear gas to brutalize John Lewis on the Edmunds Pettus Bridge on that bloody Sunday. So no, King would not have been surprised at violence against democracy. But it's not just about the members of these mobs. While condemning the rioters of his day, King reserved most of his righteous anger for their enablers. When speaking about violence in Mississippi, King called out the legislators who sparked that violence with calls for nullification of federal laws. It was not merely on those who caused violence, but those who enabled violence through rhetoric, who King said must be held responsible for all of the terror, the mob rule and brutal murders. Much attention has been placed on the individual insurrectionists of January the 6th. There's the QAnon shaman who reportedly refuses to eat non-organic food in jail. There's the realtor who traveled to Washington on a private jet, then filmed an ad for her real estate practice from the Capitol grounds. There will be others who attract widespread attention because their stories are unusual or cinematic or even absurd. Today, King would ask us to look beyond these individuals and indict the system that spurred fear and violence. Do not be distracted, he would say. Just like the white mobs of the 1960s, today's insurrectionists are being fed a steady diet of untruths. The big lie spoken openly during King's day was that African-Americans were inferior. They were a lesser people. That big lie still exists today through, though not always said as straightforwardly as it once was. And the big lie most loudly trumpeted to Americans today is that elections are being stolen. Stolen primarily in urban enclaves. We know what these lies cause, paranoia, prejudice, violence, fear. We are now reaping what the enablers have sown. Just as it, just as it was not enough to condemn those who devoted, those devoted to the big lie of Jim Crow and segregation, it is not enough just to condemn those devoted to bizarre consp conspiracy theories, rigged elections, all untethered to the facts. We must seek accountability from those in power who have actively peddled these lies to the public. In his day, King condemned the white elite who disclaimed violence yet used methods and statements that create the very atmosphere for violence. If here today, King might similarly focus on those media outlets and politicians who claim to be concerned about a stolen election while knowing the truth that no such thing happened. Our public discourse has to serve people by serving up the truth in everything we say and do. And Senator Mitt Romney had, has it right. The best way we could show respect for the voters who are upset is by telling them the truth. Perhaps the last piece of perspective King might share with us is about the power of one's voice. His sharpest denouncements were of government officials who stood in pacific passivity, refusing to enforce the law against white supremacy, its mobs and its enablers. They were indifferent. Violence develops in the whole racial struggle, he said. Only when the violent forces feel they have support and that they are aided and abetted by the law enforcement agencies. King would have found it especially important that the judiciary, our great bastion of law enforcement, 
speak truth in this moment. He called it tragic when any branch of the federal government kept quiet on assaults against his people. The images I saw on that day were not only disturbing, they pierced my soul. Witnessing the assault of a co-equal branch of government shook me to the core. And for most of us, it carved out a place of permanent memory, like the assault on the Alfred P. Murrow Federal Building or the destruction of the Twin Towers. It is important for all of us to defend our democracy and the rule of law. On that point, I'm inspired by what I learned right there at Vanderbilt just last year at a judicial seminar designed by Judge Jeremy Fogel and one of your own, your professor at the law school, Terry Maroney. And through those sessions moderated with and by other judges, like my friend and colleague, Judge William Smith, I came to learn that it is so important for all of us to defend democracy and the rule of law. When as Judge Smith put it, when respect for our democratic institutions and the rule of law, when that respect crumbles, the guardrails fail and our democracy dies. We must try to honor King today by speaking up, speaking out against deadly insurrection, the sedition that has been committed earlier this month. King demanded that the law of the land be enforced in the wake of mob violence spurred by school desegregation. And as King demanded consequences for those who spurred such violence, we must demand the same. We must condemn violence, whether it is perpetrated against those who are in the judicial branch, executive branch, or those in the halls of Congress. We cannot be bystanders when our democracy is assaulted. I know you might be thinking and wondering how surprising it is. And it might sound crazy. It might sound, what is he talking about here? a call for law enforcement during a King Day speech. Typically these speeches quote his letter from a Birmingham jail where King defends his willingness to break laws. But we often forget how that letter also says that law and order exist for the purpose of establishing justice and that each of us has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. There are no more just laws than the ones that protect the basic safety of our democracy. Laws that keep the people's house in the people's hands. Laws that ensure that every American has what King called our most sacred right, the right to the ballot. So how do we enforce the law of our land? Recall that we have been here before with each branch of government doing its due. When violent mobs terrorized African-Americans during reconstruction, the legislative branch rose up and passed the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1878, 71, which targeted the racial violence in the South undertaken by the Klan and the failure of the states to cope with that violence. The executive branch too rose up and it convened federal grand juries, many interracial that brought 3,384 indictments against the KKK. The judicial branch then stood firm and oversaw trials that, that resulted in, in over 1,000 convictions. Frederick Douglass said, this campaign of United law enforcement, of United law enforcement brought peace to many places. Recall also this brief moment of cooperative justice was followed by an era of collective cowardice that ended 
reconstruction. Insurrection and murder were allowed to go ignored, pardoned, and even celebrated in the name of reconciliation and peace. King called this kind of peace obnoxious as it was peace purchased at the price of allowing mobocracy to reign supreme over democracy. Peace purchased at the price of capitulating to the forces of darkness. I pray today that our branches of government bring about what King called real peace by delivering justice to all those who inspired, fomented, and carried out insurrection against our government. Give them due process and deliver justice to all those who inspired, fomented, and carried out insurrection against our democracy. For the sake of our democracy, we cannot tolerate an obnoxious peace. When I think about peace, I return to the power of images. I think of the man cleaning King's statue in the Capitol Rotunda so that future generations are moved by the call to racial equality. The vision of an ordinary person removing the stains from a monument to the best of our democracy can produce. That is an image of real peace. And I think about a different image. I think of the photographs of insurrectionists posing with a statue of John Calhoun in our capital. I imagine them proud of that famously pro-slavery politician the image of their pride and the monument our nation erected to inspire that pride. Some will say that is an image of obnoxious peace. It is in that image that the big lives of the past and the present converge in a single moment. Calhoun believed that black people were inferior and promoted that falsehood to his constituents. The insurrectionists bequeathed the present big lie, entered our capital rotunda and celebrated with fellow travelers in deception. We owe it to the people of this nation to tell them the truth. King said it was our duty, like a boil that can never be cured so long as it is covered up. He said injustice, must be exposed with all the tension and its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and to the air of national opinion before it can be cured. So let us open ourselves up to the ugliness of what statues of John C. Calhoun truly represent, the subjugation of other human humans. Let us take this moment to expose his belief in white supremacy, to expose the belief in white supremacy shared by too many in this nation, too many of our fellow countrymen, and ask if we want to continue to pass that belief along to future generations. I believe that we should not. The images we promote to the Capitol, that most hallowed of locations of we, the people, should tell the truth. That the American experiment has always been about making her more perfect. In that regard, there is no room for honoring Calhoun, Jefferson Davis, James Zachariah George, or anyone else that stood for enslaving, brutalizing, lynching, raping, murdering and extinguishing the hope of so many of their fellow citizens. How hard could it be to replace each state's capital's monuments with those of its heroes? The answer is not very hard. Arkansas has already announced plans to replace its Confederates with Johnny Cash and civil rights leader Daisy Bates. 
If Virginia could remove the statue of General Lee, the man who surrendered at Appomattox and replace it with Barbara John, the girl who led student protests against seg segregated schools. If Virginia can do that, Mississippi, my Mississippi could, could my Mississippi should do the same. Think of all the legends who gave their lives to Mississippi. We are the home of civil rights legends like Fannie Lou Hamer, Mega Evers, Vernon Damer, Reverend George Lee. These folk whose lives were taken by those who believed in big lives. Taken because these martyrs, these martyrs believed in democracy. My Mississippi is also home to many more cultural and literary icons. Whatever the minuscule cost of removing marble slabs and carving new ones, it is outweighed by the price of honoring the lives of the past. And that applies not just to my Mississippi, but every state that has filled our house with the likenesses of those who conspired those who took up arms and those who sought to tear our democracy asunder. What better way to end these remarks than with the powerful and the lyrical words that we heard just last week on the steps of our house and through the voice of Amanda Gordon. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken she said, but simply unfinished. We are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we're striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. Being American is more than a pride we inherit. If the past we step into, and it's, excuse me, it's the past, past we step into and how we repair it. While democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith, we trust, for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. If we merge mercy and might, and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left. And Vanderbilt, with every breath that you have, defend our democracy, defend the rule of law, and go do justice. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, so much. Uh, Judge Reeves, um, thank you. I'm um, moved to tears, which is making it difficult um, for me to express my thanks to you um, in, a, um, in a coherent way. But uh, those remarks were um, fabulous and I'm uh, deeply grateful to you. Um, let me open um, the forum uh, to uh, questions. Um, why don't you uh, chat, chat me if you uh, would like to ask a question. Um, and um, I will um, 
open it with with one. Um, I really appreciated, uh, Judge, your um, framing of the issues um, in terms of obnoxious peace. I, I think that's a, a really helpful way to think about questions of um, how to deal with the insurrection and how to uh, how, to, how to deal with the issues in front of us. Um, and you mentioned um, telling the truth and you mentioned um, uh, tearing down the monuments. Um, do you have other um, uh, things you might ask us to do as a law school or as law faculty or law, law students? Um, uh, do you have any um, other um, advice or specific wisdom um, to us? Um, and if not, I think we can just let your remarks um, stand as they, as they are. Uh, but that is a question that occurred to me. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think all law schools, all people who have the ability to shape and uh, shape the law or reshape the law. I think we're going to have to do much more with respect to reimagining our criminal justice system. We have to find a way uh, to deal with the over incarceration that we 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 have. There there is over incarceration, no doubt about it. There are excessive fines being placed on people who cannot move out of their circumstances. To, to live that better life. We are penalizing and still continue to penalize people who have made mistakes in the past, but have lifetime consequences on certain things. For example, a lifetime uh, a, a bar on participating in our democracy, participating in which they can vote. Obviously they can always participate in moving to help other candidates be, in, be elected. But, but boy, there is some power in being able to go to the voting booth. And I realize, you know, in Mississippi, there are dozens, I mean, in Mississippi, you can be uh, taken off the voter roll for writing a bad check because they deem that false pretenses. And imagine a, a, a person who errantly writes a bad check uh, 20 years ago and that person was run through a justice court system here in Mississippi where no one has appointed a lawyer. The judge who, well, let's say it's 20 years ago. It's a judge who did not even have to have a high school diploma. And that person gets a conviction because that person thought that they had $35 in their, in their checking account when they only had $32 and they wrote a check for $33. And that person is convicted for, uh, for false pretenses. And that person uh, uh, doesn't appeal because I'm there in justice court. They told me to pay back the $33. They tapped on another $15 fee for whatever it was. So I don't have all that. He's convicted. And 20 years ago would be, you know, 1990 or so, whatever year it would be. But that person will not be able to vote today because of that thing. So, so, so obviously, I, you know, those of you who are in law school, repair our system, criminal justice system, our civil justice system. All there needs to be reformed throughout our law, uh, through throughout how we see the America that we want it to be. Uh, so I would encourage the law schools to focus on clinicals, you know, domestic violence, I mean, divorce, I mean, just the day-to-day -day things, uh, all the things. And, and yes, there are people in prison who are innocent. There are, they are innocent. Courts have found they did not do it years after they served the sentence because people were so underrepresented, because people didn't care. So I would you know, ask the law schools to please take a step and just look at how, how do we reimagine a criminal justice and civil justice system for all of us in this democracy. Uh, thank you. The, um, the chats are 
um, literally filled judge with um, dozens, if not a hundred or more people thanking you, um, thanking you for being informative. Thank you for speaking uh, truth to power. Um, I do have um, uh, one question, um, which I will read to you. Um, Anne Applebaum wrote an article on coexistence and said that millions sympathize with the capital insurrectionists and everyone else must figure out how to live alongside them. Why shouldn't the insurrectionists have to figure out how to live alongside us? What is your take on that quote? Thank you for that wonderful question. <laughs> Uh, too bad I couldn't get these thought-provoking questions in advance because you didn't know what I was going to say <laughs> and I didn't know what, what you might ask. Um, I think uh, we have to make sure that they are encouraged to live among us. The values of the insurrectionists are not American at all. I mean, I, I know there's this debate. Yes, like H. Rap Brown said, violence is just uh, is just as good as you know American violence is what like uh, cherry pie. It's just it's just here. But but I think in order for us to move forward, and and and, and, and you know, uh, I, I think I think no, they should be forced to come along with us, and we should not have to dilute or do anything with respect to what our vision of living among the free ought to be about. So uh, I have not read Ms. Applebaum's uh, article. I, uh, I think I saw some snippet, somebody talking about it on television probably this morning, uh, but, but I do believe that no, those insurrectionists have no real place in our democracy and uh, because they tried to tear down our democracy. And I mean, uh, we should not uh, sort, have, sort of do anything which, uh, uh, or relinquish the hopes that we have uh, in making this country either more perfect or greater than it's been before. Thank you. Judge, um, uh, one, uh, um, uh, another question. I recently read that there's an ongoing discussion between DOJ and another entity that not all persons involved in the insurrection should be charged and prosecuted because doing so could overburden the court system. Um, what does this say about equal justice? Uh, this question is from Judge Donald. Uh, thank you so much um, for that question, Judge. Um, and um, uh, yes, Judge Reeves, I will uh, let you take it um, from, from there. Um, uh, Victoria, could you unmute uh, Judge Donald in case um, there can be an exchange that way? And I'll just, uh, I'll just back off and let the, the judges uh, talk. <laughs> Well, uh, th thank you, Donald, for that question. She, she is a, a true hero among uh, many of us in the judiciary. Uh, I think the one answer to, well, it might overburden the courts, then we build new courts. We, 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 we appoint more judges. We do whatever we take to, to prove to the American people. See, nobody wants to, I mean, you know, uh, again, one of the things that has become clear to us that we saw all this summer and beyond that now America really believes and now it's seen it with its own eyes. They've seen the disparate treatment of African-Americans in our judicial system and our First Amendment rights and all of that stuff and everybody else. They've seen it. Had Black folk rioted and gone and torn down the Capital, I think we would have seen much more blood. That's just what I believe. Now, so is it again, is it, is it important to the American people to stab black folk in the heart again and say that we're not going to prosecute individuals who put the lives of members of Congress 
in jeopardy? Who killed someone standing up to protect them? Are we, is that acceptable? I think not. So I think, I, 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 you know, obviously the, best, the most powerful tool that a prosecutor has that they seem to never use in our criminal justice system on state and federal, I'm a witness, is the power of discretion. We see the power of discretion not being used at all in our criminal justice system. So now we understand, now you have this newfound belief in discretion, the discretion not to prosecute those who, who, who did all of this, who participated in all of this. I think we get new judges. I think we do things. I, I think we, you do whatever you can do to make, to hold people accountable. That's what I think. But I'm not in the executive and I'm not in the legislative branch, but I will stand firm as a judicial, judicial officer who has that duty and who has, you know, who's, who's taken an oath like everyone else. Judge Donald, since you asked that question, I know you have the answer. That's my <laughs> friend. For, she's from Mississippi, y'all. That's what I did. Yeah. She's from Mississippi. And we're so Judge proud of her. Thank you, Judge Reeves, um, and what, a, what an incredible and powerful message. I don't have the answer, but I, I will say I agree with you. I, I think it sends a terrible message when uh, the blanket of, 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 of ju equal justice and the garment of accountability does not fall equally on all people. And you talk about discretion. I see discretion uh, used all the time. It's just that it, that discretion is used disparately. And what does that say to a people who are being held accountable for things like possessing a bullet casing and being subjected, if they're a felon, to 15 years in federal prison, not when they're threatening, threatening anyone with the bullet casing, or the person who, who uh, Soldiers, what does that say when uh, their fullness as a citizen uh, is taken away and they're prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law, uh, but they look at other things where there is a, a threat and an assault upon democracy and, that there, and there's death in the process that we say this would overburden the, the court system. Uh, it's not as if all people were from a particular state. It's not that all prosecutions have to occur in a particular state. Uh, we've got uh, a system that is that is capable of handling uh, mass um, mass offenses, and and while I just read this, and I don't know uh, whether you know how they will come out on that, but I do think it's important that every individual is held accountable under the law, that every individual is is protected by the law, um, and. I would say that it is instances like this that cause a decline in the confidence and trust in our justice system. And everyone who is a stakeholder must be concerned uh, about that. And I, I just wanna say that I am so pleased that you sent me an email last night alerting me to this event. I wouldn't have missed it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Judge. And for the people on this call, I want you all to know, lest you all get ideas. I am the self-appointed president of the Carlton Reeves fan club. So just don't even go there. Uh, there's no election. There's no democratic process. I am self-appointed. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. Um, I think we have time for um, one more uh, question. Uh, 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 Victoria, can you unmute uh, Jeribu Hill, who raised a question in the chat? Well, well, I didn't know that I was just putting my question in for my, my teacher, my leader, my friend, just so proud of you, Judge Reeves, for being such an amazing, courageous truth teller. I put in the chat my frustration about the lack of accountability and the lack of courage that we see among leaders, which we sometimes call pleaders because they don't really stand up. 
how do we address leadership by avoidance? We tried to address the issue of Trump's killing machine, where so many people were executed before he left office under the federal death penalty. And we, met, we were met with silence from those that we would have thought would have taken those issues up. We were met with silence, no return phone calls, that type of avoidance when you step into the light and you say you're a leader or you say you represent those who are dispossessed and oppressed, and then you turn a blind eye to the more difficult issues. So how, how would you say that we should go about addressing that type of leadership by avoidance? Uh, 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 you know, I, I, I'm one who believes in the political process. I'm a student of political science and I've lost and been involved in many elections where we lost, <laughs> uh, but I've also been involved in some victories. I think you hold people accountable by uh, uh, getting them out of office, uh, uh, by, by at least showing them that you're upset enough to either run against them, put somebody up against them, or to campaign uh, 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 in every way uh, uh, as hard as you can against them, and maybe that will uh, uh, maybe that will uh, put some courage, some courage in them to do right things in the future. But I, I, I do believe in the political process. Thank you, Judge. Um, we are at the hour, so um, on behalf of the entire community. Um, oh, um, one, I'm sorry, I just got a chat. One, one more question. And since it's from uh, Ms. Uh, Paschal Graffried, um, I'm gonna um, use the moderator privilege um, and allow that question. Uh, Victoria, can you unmute? I can unmute. Oh, you can unmute yourself, I'm yes. sorry. <laughs> okay. Hey, Judge Reeve, thank you so much for that powerful, powerful lecture. Um, it made me both um, angry and also um, sad about what uh, has transpired. But I wanted to ask you this question. Um, one of the judges released um, the 22-year-old who was going to sell Pelosi's laptop to uh, Russian intelligence, released her to her mother's um, care, you know, instead of her being held over in prison until her trial and talking about how the constitution works for her. I'm kind of bothered by why didn't the constitution work for this young man, can't remember his name, who stole a backpack and he was in jail for three years, was never let out. And, um, and after he, they finally dismissed the case and he ended up because of probably horrific things that happened to him during those three years in, in, in prison, committed suicide. So where was the constitution then? And how or when will we ever begin to address these, un, these injustices under the law for people of color? Yeah, you know, make sure that you, you, you either elect or, or appoint good judges. And that's starting by making sure you have uh, uh, great law students and great lawyers and that they are doing the right things that they're developing in their practice. Judges have a lot of discretion to do many different things. You have to make sure that you also have persons who are uh, of good mind to be prosecutors. I used, I used to say that I would not want to ever be a prosecutor when I was growing up in the law and as a young, as a law student and as a young lawyer said, I would never be the prosecutor. But I think if I were in the public criminal justice system, a prosecutor is just what I would want to be today. Because the prosecutor has all the power, all the cards, the legislature and Congress have given the prosecutors all the power. That power includes the power to do good. And so, uh, so I think, you know, you, you, again, holding persons accountable, holding, uh, 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 again, electing and appointing the best people, people with life experiences to be judges uh, who can do, you know, who, who can make 
uh, calls that, that, you know, and again, great advocates. I don't know who was representing that young lady. She might have had a great advocate. The prosecutor, on the other hand, could have just said, well, who knows? I wasn't there. I don't know what the context of all that is. But I think if you, we work on making sure that judges reflect the communities in which they serve, reflect those who come before it, reflect the population, reflect, you know, that diversity in judges uh, 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 can bring about a, a, a diversity in thought, I think. So, uh, I, and, and I don't want to, you know, answer your particular question directly because it does involve the action of another judge who, who said that he looked at the Bail Reform Act, I presume, and said that there were conditions that this person could meet, you know, because because there is a presumption that number one, you're innocent. Everybody who goes before a magistrate judge having been charged with a crime, there's a presumption that you're innocent. That's number one. And there's a presumption that you should be let go. It's the government's burden to overcome that presumption. And in that instance, I presume the government did not. There, there were tools that the judge said, I can use. I can use these tools. I can put her on home confinement. I can give her a bond. I can do, I can put a lock on her ankle. I can do whatever because all I want to do is just make sure of is that she comes to the next appearances that the court has for her, that she comes to the next hearing, that she comes to the next trial. That's all. So, you know, of course, you know, when I talked about in the speech, I talked about uh, doing justice, but I also, and I want to make clear that, you know, due process, we're all entitled to it. Give them due process. Give everybody due process, just like that young lady was. And then, you know, you can, uh, uh, the, the outcome might be one that we, that we necessarily will not agree with, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, uh, we have to understand that that constitution that I've been talking about, the one that I wrap my arms around, the one that I claim to love so very much, it applies to and it protects and it should protect all of us. And that's what we ought to demand from everybody, all of our elected officials, all of our appointed officials, that this constitution applies to the benefit of us all. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, be well, um, be safe. Thank you on behalf of our entire community. All right. Thank you all so very much for having me.